Now, welcome to another edition of News from Naboo. Halloween edition. Which means later today, Halloween well, Halloween memes. memes. Yes. But for now, let's get right to the news. All right. Collectors, keep an, uh, an eye at the new this week in Star Wars section because there will be plenty of news below. Yay. Or later. But on to the article. And or. And or director Toby Haynes on making Star Wars the subtle way. Ooh. Mm-hmm. We're kind of going to go over an interview he did with The Hollywood Reporter. He was the director for episodes 1, 2, 3, as well as the current arc, 8, 9, and 10. He kind of discussed his time working on the series, especially how he handled episode 8. He kind of will we'll go over some of this, but some bullet points we're going to be going over are how Fiona Shaw would shoot her scenes in the freezing cold, on how he's a Star Wars fan, and how that affects the work he did, Tony Gilroy on recruiting Andy Serkis, and how shooting with... Luthan Rail and Saul Guerra was a career highlight for him. And a great scene. Yeah. <laughs> and a great scene. So I guess spoilers for episode 8, just in yeah, case. Yeah, they're probably going to be in there yeah. a little bit. They're definitely going to be in there, I think. Not much, but a little bit. Yeah. Haynes took over directing duties on the first three episodes a couple of months before shooting it. He insisted he had enough time to prep. He says, yeah, I probably had more prep time on this project than I've had for most of my projects, so it was a very generous amount of prep time. But the scope and scale that they wanted, like all projects, always outstrips the budget and the time you have to do it. So we had to hit the ground running. On my second day or something, I went out to see the construction they were doing at Marlow, which is where they built Ferrix. And I saw the scale of what they were doing. And that's when I realized just how deep in the shit I was in. So it was a huge responsibility. And it was incredibly exciting. I like to hear when they get humbled by the scope and scale of what they're creating. What, you know... Mm-hmm. what Star Wars can be and should be, this kind of massive... You don't hear them excited about the scope and scale of the volume. No, and which is kind of unfortunate. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think the volume, as we've talked about, is incredible it's technology, but yeah. it, it is not the same watching something on the volume when you're actually there and it's built and it's kind of real and more tangible. I have to feel it affects the actors' performances as well to be like, this is this is real, this is here, I'm in character, I'm on this planet, I'm here is everything. Yeah. Here, yeah, I can physically go up and touch everything. I can walk into the distance. You know, everything is actually here. And mm-hmm. again, I think the volume is great. I think it's, for better or worse, it's the future of filming. But I think it has a ways to go before it can even... It's kind of like CGI. CGI is great, but it never quite captures the real thing. Right. When it's not quite yeah. perfect. So it's I think, not going to be. I think the volume will get to that point where it's like, it's really, really good, but there's still something about filming on location that is better. Mm-hmm. Haynes is a lifelong Star Wars fan and was a bit hesitant at first when he got the job because Gilroy insisted on people involved in the series keeping their fandom apart and focusing on telling the story he laid out as close as possible. Haynes says the following about Gilroy. He's super smart and it's clear on the page what he wants, but he's also incredibly fluid and open to ideas. He really wanted me to take ownership of it visually and bring my own style to it. I kept saying, do you want to know more about my lens choices? And he said, do you know what you're going to do? And I was like, yep. And he was like, that's all I need to know. So he's kind of the best exec to work with in that way. There was some stuff from block one that he really envisioned quite clearly. And he wanted to see that realized. But then he was equally ready to throw it all away when there's a better idea or a different idea. So he's very adaptable. It's always great to hear because, you know, a lot of times a creator has tunnel vision. They have their vision. They're going to achieve their vision no matter what. They don't want to hear anybody else's ideas. This is what I want. This is how I see it. And sometimes, you know, a good creator will listen and be like, oh, I guess you maybe have a point. I mean, look at the prequels. I love the prequels, right? But George Lucas was kind of surrounded by yes men, wasn't he? I don't Mm -hmm. think too many people were trying to challenge George Lucas on what Star Wars should be during the filming of the prequels, right? And again, love the prequels. I know people get angry when I say they could have been better films, but... Had Lucas maybe listened and some people interjected here and there, perhaps they would have been a little better. He goes on to say, Tony was nervous about how much I love Star Wars, but I also say that I'm a dramatist first and a Star Wars fan second. So what comes first for me is the story and the characters and what we're trying to do. But when you see your first droid on set, you do get really excited about it. And you have to make a concerted effort to just make sure it stays in the background. Tony was very clear about that. He never wanted to foreground the monsters. He never wanted to foreground the droids. He wanted it to be part of the fabric of the piece, but not to do a special shot where you're announcing a new alien or something like that. 
He really wanted it to feel completely integrated in the world that he was presenting and not presented in and of itself. I kind of agree and disagree on this one. Mm, Because I I get what he's saying. You want the aliens to feel like a natural part of everything, that they're just interweaved into the fabric of Star Wars and they're there and they go about their daily lives the same way humans do. But we should have some aliens in the foreground. Well, they just needed to be characters, right? Exactly, yeah. We needed at least one Mm -hmm. actual alien character, I think. I mean, I say at least. Probably could have done a couple more. And so far, we've had some aliens that have some speaking lines, but no real characterization, no real story Mm -hmm. behind them. They're just kind of there. And again, I get that. But the problem is, you kind of gotten to the. We've kind of gotten to the point where the the galaxy in this show feels like it's a human galaxy that has aliens that are in it, Mm -hmm. instead of a galaxy that the humans are just a part of. And yes, they are a large part of. You know, they're the most prominent species in the galaxy. But it should feel like they're just a part of the galaxy instead of it's their galaxy. And yeah, there's aliens in it that, you know, are in the background as well. In the first arc, we see Marva, Fiona Shaw's character. She wouldn't turn on the heater when Cassian and Brasso insisted on her doing it. Haynes also directed those episodes and explained that they shot those scenes around Christmas and it was freezing. So that when you see Marva's breath in the episode, it's completely realistic. He says, there was a time it had snowed, and there were people using heaters to burn snow off the ground to kind of keep the continuity, but it was freezing. Marva's interior and exterior set were the same set, so it was fully a three-dimensional world, but it was so cold. That's why you can see her breath when she talks. You can see that she's freezing cold, and that's why she's not putting the heating on. Cassie was worried about her sitting in the cold because she's going to get sick. Surprise, surprise, episode eight, we hear that she's sick. Yeah, maybe they just I mean, had to change the script. Oh, she got I didn't even sick, realize so. those details, like Cassie complaining, hey, it's cold in here, you should be turning on the heater, and now she's sick. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's dedication to her craft, too, right? That she Absolutely. was going to sit in the... She didn't have to, but no. to make it a little more realistic, you know, she decided to sit there. Yeah, you can tell us the character's cold without being able to see her breath. Yeah. Yeah, I. it's impressive. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wonder if she uh, purposely fell and hit her head to get that bruise, or if it's... A, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. She, of course, didn't go that far, No, right? of course. <laughs> But no, I, it's awesome to hear when you really want to get into your character. You want to get into that moment and make it as genuine and as real as possible. And I know an actor's job is to make it real regardless of the circumstances. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's got to help when, again, we were talking about before with the volume. It's always got to help when you have something physically there or some kind of physical feeling or something to interact with. It's just always got to make a difference, I'd imagine. As we know, episode 8 included the surprise appearance by Andy Serkis, who we already know as Supreme Leader Snoke. A surprise to be sure, but mm, a welcome. I had, a, I had to say it. And Andor, Serkis is playing Kino Loy, and as Haynes reveals, Tony Gilroy had been trying to convince him to join the series. For well, that was a good months. idea because I, I loved him in this. God, like Andy Serkis is such a talented actor, isn't he? Like, I, you know, I don't know that I've ever really realized just how, you know, because he's Gollum, he's, you know, Snoke, he's, a lot of the times he's digitally captured. But damn, every time he's in live action, like, I am impressed with what this guy does. Haynes says, Tony had been talking to Andy for a while. He was trying to line him up, but was unsure whether he was going to do it or not. He was coming off a big directing gig, but we were all very excited by the idea of him joining. I know Andy separately through an old friend of mine, and I'd met him a couple of times, so the chance of actually working with him was very exciting for me, and then suddenly, there he was on set. It all came together in a very short space of time, and he had some big ideas of what he wanted to do with the character, and now I can't imagine it being anybody else. There was never any other option, really it had to be Andy. The fact that he has Star Wars heritage was neither here nor there for us. To us, he was Kino, and it was all about him and what he could bring to it. It was a chance for him to really act a lot. He got a lot of screen time in our short block. So he wanted to do something special with the character. So he's going to become Snoke, right? That's what that means. Yes, Confirm. this is where Kino Loy turns into Snoke. <laughs> if you rearrange the letters and add a bunch of them extra it letters extra to ones, it, it's yeah. totally... So that's oh, I wish they now they would have actually called him like, you know, something E Snoke. I don't know. Something, you know, where you rearrange the letters and... Uh, <laughs> It Snoke. turns into snow, or I am Snoke, like I am Voldemort kind of thing. <laughs> you can't oh say my that god! Name. Oh, sorry. He who shall not be named, thank, or whatever. Thank you. But I think that would have been hilarious. But of course, Star Wars fans would have been like, "Oh my god, <laughs> he's gonna be Snoke somehow." <laughs> what else is interesting? Haynes dodged the question about what they're building in the prison. We've all been wondering what the heck are they building. He simply said, "It's the building blocks of the Empire." You might want to ask Tony about it. Death Star parts. <laughs> I mean, I They're guess. building parts for another prison. 
<laughs> that's great. Oh my god, they're building the next. They're prison. building another prison. Oh, that's there's. Oh, that's actually just brilliant <laughs> in a weird sort of way, and yet so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> prisoners building their own prison. Prisoners building the prison for the next prisoners. Yep. Ah, uh, yes. You know you're imprisoning too many people when you need your prisoners to build more prisons. Exactly. All right, but I find that very interesting. I really yeah. do hope they show us. I mean, they technically don't have to, but they I feel to, like yeah. they I want to know. I kind of thought it was kind of implied it would be like Death Star parts or something where it's just a... Re- I mean, you're making the same piece over and over, so it's something, you know... It could be any sort of ship part, though, really. It could be, yeah, it could be for... Star Destroyers, TIE, TIE Fighters, yeah. I mean, there's a lot That's of different things. That's what it things. is. They're yeah. TIE Fighter parts. They, they might be. They kind of have that the that, look that of the wing. The center yeah. piece for the wing? Well, who knows for sure. We'll just make lots of guesses and be wrong. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say Death Star. Final answer. Haynes also discussed filming the uh, interchange between Saw Gerrera and Luthen Rail in the eighth episode, which was ex- he was like extremely excited about and described as a career highlight. Oh my god, that was an amazing day. We were all nervous. I had phone calls from Forrest the night before, and he was asking me questions about kyber crystals and backstory. Awesome. But we did this incredible rehearsal where they just read the scene for the first time and went at it. They really went at each other. And there was this incredible tension in the room as they read the scene. And honestly, if I could have filmed that first time they read the scene, I would have been overjoyed to have gotten that performance from both of them. I had this idea about how to structure the scene. I wanted to end on an extreme close-up of Forrest at the end of his rant about all the separatist groups of the Alliance. A really direct, face-on shot would really bring you into the argument and build that intensity. So I just got him to do the speech over and over again, and I was like, go crazy with it. And that close-up was one of the best close-ups of my career. Seeing him do that was absolutely magical, and to have him play opposite a heavyweight like Stellan was a career highlight. Yeah, I mean, that, that was... That scene was powerful. That scene, that's, oh, it, it was like heavyweights, but not like necessarily fighting each other, but fighting to make the scene better as a whole. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love how it starts out, like, you know, they're talking about the Aldani job, like, well, now I know you, you know, let's go, let's say it was Star a masterpiece. Jovial. Yeah, they're, they're kind of joking around, like, well, let's agree it was a masterpiece, and, you know, Luthen's like, well, now I know you did it, because you're, you know, mm-hmm. it was just, it's it's a, such a flawless scene. And, and, it, and then they mince words, and they, they're, now they're arguing. And well, yeah, but what starts out with them not trusting each other, right, and then it kind of, that kind of bubbles to the forefront, right? You realize mm-hmm. that, no, they don't trust each other, they don't really know who each other is and what their motivations are. It's like... This is such such great writing and acting. It, it's like so joyful to see Star Wars that good. In our last section here, Haynes discussed how the show deals with the gray areas between the blacks and whites depicted in the original Star Wars trilogy during the Galactic Civil War. For that, Gilroy used the characters of Luth and Rail and Cyril Karn, and Haynes couldn't help but praise that decision. It's very easy to paint the bad guys as black and white bad guys, The scariest kind of bad guy is a bad guy who genuinely thinks they're doing the right thing. And so to see that in three dimensions, it makes you think a lot more about what it takes to be a good guy. It's also important to subvert the moral construct of what the Alliance really is. They're the good guys and live by a moral code, but I think Tony's trying to say that if you actually want to get something done, you sometimes need people who live in the gray areas between good and bad. Sometimes you have to do things that you're not happy about, and you have to break your own rules. People are constantly struggling with whether or not they're doing the right thing. And you see that with Luthen and Cyril. No, I, I think that's one of the best parts is because, you know, when a bad guy or an evil character or whatever, the antagonist truly believes in their cause, you know, that, that, that they're willing to go and do whatever it takes to achieve victory. You know, what is what is the hero supposed to do in it's response? Like a Thanos. It, it is kind of like a Thanos. But I mean... How far is the hero willing to go? I mean, they obviously believe, you know, in the just and right cause most of the time, right? But you know, the fa- trick is to get the audience to believe it, too. Well, sure, that's part of the trick, but it's also part of the, you know, the conflict of the good guy. Like, how far am I willing to go to win before I become what I, you know, it says it right in Revenge of the Sith, you know, before I become what you swore to destroy. Mm-hmm. It's it's I love those kind of stories. I love when there is some complex. And don't get me wrong, I love the black and white of the original trilogy, if you will, the good versus evil. That's also enjoyable in its own way. But sometimes that that nuance of you know how far are you willing to go to achieve victory over someone who truly believes they're in the right. It's it's great stuff. It's time for everybody's favorite da, section: da, new da, this week in Star Wars, etc. Tuesday. Da, da. I have a lot to cover, so don't waste well, I'm time. That, I wasn't wasting time. Yes, I was it was adding to the. These people ambience. have lives, and you're slowing it down or something. 
Tuesday, High Republic Junior Novel, Quest for the Hidden City. Yay? Yay. The second of the High Republic novel book things. Yeah, the first one was okay. We're also getting a reprint of Essential Legend books, and a couple of these I want to get. We've got The Old Republic, Deceived, and The Old Republic, Revan, as well as X-Wing, The Back to War. Mm, yeah, it's good stuff. Mm-hmm. Black Series Christmas figures are on sale. Chewbacca is coming from GameStop, Scout Trooper from Walmart, and Clone Trooper from Hasbro Pulse in Shop Disney. More from Hasbro, <laughs> because I'm going to give it all to you straight here. Pre-ordering on November 1st, excluding Pipeline figures, Vintage Collection, Return of the Jedi Specialty Wave, with a bunch of aliens, Woof, Yakface, Nikto, and Kithabada. I'm making that last one up. You it's did, a word. Yeah, I'm that. sorry, everybody. We're also getting for Vintage, Return of the Jedi Speeder Bike with Scout Trooper, and Deluxe Paz Vizsla. For their pipeline, they showed off a another Moth, Cad Bane from Book of Boba Fett, and Nine Nub. <laughs> I'm not messing up any more names. <laughs> He's from Jer-Gerod. Return of the Jedi, Sorry. yes. The, the guy Vader meets at the beginning of Return of the Jedi at the Death Star. There you go. On to the Black Series, pre-ordering again November 1st, which is Tuesday, excluding Pipeline. We have Darth Malak. Bah, bah, bah. Oh, so cool. I know in the comments he's going to be very excited. He can finally get a little mini him. <laughs> so with, cool. Hey, with removable jaw. Yes. Yes. Well, that's important. It is. We're getting Bastila Shan. So cool. Scar Trooper Mick from Task Force 99. Well, that's cool. Dr. Afra. I already have one, but I guess. Mara Jade. Uh-huh. That's uh-huh. all I'll say. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> that that's it. In their pipeline announcements were Ahsoka Tano, the Clone Wars season three. Very cool. Magnaguard. Oh my god, we needed the Magnaguard already. About time. You yep. need like a bunch of Magnaguards. We needed that like years ago when they did the Maybe Grievous. they can help hold that Grievous figure up who never I know, wants to we're stand. gonna like prop him against the, the Magnaguards. <laughs> the Magnaguard. I hope they have like really holding, yeah. Can they have like one arm? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, they're all arm in arm with each other. It's gonna be it's gonna be great. <laughs> Clone Trooper Phase Two and Omega Season Two Bad Batch. Strange on that Omega season. You would think they would kind of save that for... It's Pipeline. Bad Batch. Yeah, but save it for Bad Batch reveals, right? That, those Maybe they will don't be happening in a couple months. Bad Batch reveals. You mean the new color armor each of them has? Yes, Great. exactly. Wednesday, Andor, Episode 9. Woohoo! Indeed. Can't Middle wait. piece of the next arc. Yeah. Comics, we have Star Wars 29, Bounty Hunters 28, and the Mando adaptation is up to number five. So sad that that's just been a straight recap of the episodes. No extra no. info. No. Sadness. Disappointing, yeah. And then we don't have anything else interesting till Sunday, where the Black Series Christmas Mandalorian goes on sale through Target, and it happens to also be Daylight Savings Time. Oh, well, that's good to know, I actually. include etc., and that's, that is that's ex- my etc. That, yeah. for the week. <laughs> Daylight savings time. It's fall back, so everybody gets that extra hour. So you can rewatch an episode of Andor. That's a good thing to do, yeah. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That's my plan. Well, that is all we got for you this time, so take to the comments below. Tell us what you think of any and all of today's news, or my lightning takes on them, I suppose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're even going to grunt now, aren't you? All right. Well, anyway, leave your comments below. Let's talk some Star Wars. Check out the Halloween special later tonight. And until next time, thanks for watching.